What is the condition of free speech in America today? I'm Sanford Unger, director of the Free Speech Project at Georgetown University. And on this video series, Speaking Freely, we talk from time to time with scholars, policymakers, and journalists involved in the free speech drama unfolding in America. This time, Ronald Krotosinski, a First Amendment expert from the University of Alabama Law School. Professor Krotosinski, you have uh, written and talked about uh, the difference between how we regard free speech in the United States and how other countries, including Western countries, uh, deal with free speech issues. And I, I wonder if you could explain that to me uh, a little bit more. Sure. Uh, in the United States, we have probably the broadest protection of freedom of expression in the world. There are no restrictions, even on uh, calls to violent revolution. Uh, and so uh, we take the view, essentially, that the worst thing imaginable is for the government to have the ability to engage in viewpoint or content-based censorship. And it reflects, really, a, a very deep-seated mistrust in government and the ability of government to improve or enhance the marketplace of ideas, particularly the political marketplace of ideas. In the rest of the world, Canada, South Africa, the United Kingdom, Germany, France, virtually everywhere other than, say, Japan, the view is that the government can actually improve or enhance the functioning of freedom of speech and also the process of democratic deliberation. And so regulations of speech aimed at enhancing or improving the political marketplace of ideas are seen as fully consistent with a meaningful commitment to freedom of expression. How, how, how do those particular systems deal with this very thorny issue of who decides? Where do you draw the line? How wise are the judges or the administrative officers or the people who make this decision of what speech is offensive? That question reflects an American perspective. Of course it does. Uh, you, it presupposes that administrators are bad. I'm from the government, I'm here to help. It's pejorative as opposed to <laughs> welcome. Oh, you're here to help? Great, come on in. So fr from a German perspective, uh, allowing a legislator or an executive officer or a judge to decide what kinds of political speech should be tolerated doesn't produce the kind of angst that it does in the United States, even for me. I mean, I, I'm a Democrat, I'm a progressive, but I, I worry about the ability of government to write rules because I think of an us-them kind of dynamic, particularly sure. in the current political environment. I think that's in our uh, DNA, to worry well, about what government pluralistic. will do to uh, us. Right? We, we don't have ties of ethnicity, religion. Uh, we come from all points of the globe. We have all sorts of commitments. We have all sorts of rural, urban, uh, secular, religious. When you think about the divisions that exist in our community, it's not surprising that people would be skeptical of government. I mean, if you live in Chicago and polls control the mayorship and you're Irish, you think, oh, damn it, the, the sidewalks are going to be terrible, the schools aren't going to be funded. And if you're, if you're Polish, you think, yes, score. Uh, and so there's this natural uh, uh, assumption that if they could control government, they could do bad things. In fact, our entire system of government, uh, the Constitution of 1787, reflects a profound mistrust of government. Right, but um, you, now you just used the example of Germany, and you have written that, German, that, that the U.S. places less value on dignity and reputation than, than Germany does. Is Germany not a special case because they, they have seen the worst that can possibly happen uh, as a result of free speech? You're exactly right to posit that the Holocaust and the evils of National Socialism led Germany to adopt as Article One of the Basic Law the inviolability of human dignity. And in fact, Article Two protects the right to free development of the personality. So Article One and Article Two of Germany's Bill of Rights protect dignity and free development of the personality. The German Basic Law, though, has been the template that most governments have used in writing new constitutions. Take South Africa, 1996. Uh, there again, it's a dignity equality based vision of human rights. Canada, in applying its charter, 
has essentially said that human dignity and multiculturalism are, uh, uh, they don't quite use the word sacrament, uh, but they come close to it uh, in decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada. And so while the motivation for Germany adopting this position is exactly the one you posit, it has been profoundly influential, and the basic law has served as a template far more often than our Bill of Rights. Other examples, other places that you think have been successful at uh, mediating uh, governing speech in a way? Well, I don't know that I said Germany was successful. Uh, I think it's profoundly unsuccessful in some ways. It ought to give us pause. Uh, as a theoretical matter, uh, banning racist, sexist, homophobic, anti-Semitic speech is something I would sign on to gladly if we could rely on government to operationalize those rules with an even hand. Well, there you are. You're being suspicious of government. Well, you have to be, because when you look at how these rules work, even in places like Germany, they're inconsistently enforced. Uh, in Canada, for example, the hate speech laws can only be enforced by the federal attorney general or a provincial attorney general. And so uh, there's a case involving a fellow named David Ahinikiu out in I think Manitoba or Saskatchewan. He's a First Nations or Native American, as we would say. He goes on the radio and says Hitler was wonderful. Uh, he killed six million Jews. I wish he'd gotten more. He's brought up on hate speech charges. Uh, the uh, conviction is thrown out for technical reasons, and the AG initiates another prosecution. But we have contrast. The AG being the federal attorney general. The, uh, the provincial attorney general. Provincial uh, attorney general. Uh, by way of contrast, during the secession vote in Quebec in the 90s, uh, leaders of the Parti Québécois, Lucien Bouchard, a guy named Perizzo, went around saying that the problem with Quebec was white people weren't having enough babies. That's a quote. Uh, and that only lime pure or white wool is true Quebec. And in fact, the evening of the plebiscite, uh, there was a Latina clerk at a downtown Montreal uh, hotel, and one of these leaders berated her and said, people like you are the problem with this province. Uh, and no charges were brought. Uh, Jean Chrétien and members of his cabinet denounced Paris and Bouchard, called them racists, but there was never even the hint uh, that the AG, uh, federal or provincial, uh, would bring a prosecution. Uh, Eminem, the rapper, uh, had been uh, the subject of calls for hate speech regulations over some of his rap sexism. Uh, on the other hand, an academic uh, named Tabani went out to Vancouver and said Americans are bloodthirsty killers and do nothing but bring war and hatred. And uh, we could make a technical argument about whether Americans are an ethnicity, uh, but uh, the, this, the Minister of Culture was there and there wasn't even a hint that this sort of language invoking hatred toward Americans as a group uh, should be the subject of a criminal process. Is that just because anti-Americanism is popular in Canada? Well, but that's the point, isn't it? Uh, if you're an American, if you're an expat living in Vancouver uh, and uh, a prominent academic at a government-sponsored uh, conference is, is saying that you're a bloodthirsty killer uh, with, with murdering instincts, you know, that degrades you, that dehumanizes well, you. Well, of course, any generalization like that about anybody anywhere is always unfortunate and probably improper and almost always not true. Correct. Uh, Germany's had problems too. They're very vigilant on uh, Nazi speech and anti-Semitic speech, but making totalizing statements about people of Turkish ancestry doesn't lead to the same reliable government response. And so uh, when we look at how these rules play out, it's very hard for institutions that are elected through democratic processes to uh, apply rules involving content and viewpoint-based speech regulations in ways that don't reflect majoritarian bias. Right. There's been problems in Canada, too. Uh, they were seizing uh, uh, the inventory of a bookstore in Vancouver called the Little Sisters Bookstore. It was aimed at the uh, LGBTQ community. And these books were available to Vancouver Public Library, but they couldn't get them across the border. They were being treated as obscene because you had mid-40s heterosexual customs agents looking being at these things over. Being treated as obscene by the United States, you mean? Uh, by the Canadian government. By the Canadian government. Yes, which, which reveres. The word I was looking for is reveres. They revere multiculturalism and right. difference. But when uh, the customs office was systematically discriminating against the aesthetics of LGBTQ persons, uh, the court told the customs service cut it out but didn't invalidate the regulation which created this discretion. And to my, to my eyes, it's perfectly predictable that a customs agent, when you ask them to look for degrading or dehumanizing erotica, would view erotica that's foreign or different uh, as dehumanizing or degrading. That's not surprising that it's that would happen. entirely predictable. Right. Yeah. But right. the Canadians don't seem 
don't seem as worried about that problem as they should be. And, and I think that was really remarkable about the Little Sisters bookstore case. You would think if you're committed to multiculturalism that you would adopt the aesthetic of the other and ask within the community to which this material is directed, is this degrading or dehumanizing? And if the answer is no, then it should be protected as speech under Section 2B of the Charter. That's not at all how the majority framed it. Uh, Justice Jacobucci uh, said that should be the framing device and we should use a minority community metric uh, to apply the degrading or dehumanizing test, uh, but that's not what the majority did. And, and so uh, as I look at how countries like Germany and Canada and South Africa operationalize rules against hate speech, I see uh, very troubling inconsistency that's predictable and the product of, of government agents selected through democratic processes directly or indirectly bringing to bear the points of view of their constituents. So would you favor content-based regulation of speech in the United States? No. Not at all? Well, no. Uh, let me hasten to add though that when we talk about content-based we have to be very careful. Are restrictions on campaign expenditures or contributions content-based speech restrictions? I would argue they aren't. Uh, to the extent that uh, uh, monetary limitations apply to all potential speakers, there are structural regulation. Uh, net neutrality, is that content-based? No. You have a choke point on the marketplace, on the on-ramps to the marketplace of ideas you regulate. It. We did that with the telephone companies right. when Ma Bell was a monopoly. Years, right. We did that with cable. Uh, the 92 Cable Act has forced access to cable platforms, limits the number of affiliated stations you can put on, has least access requirement uh, provisions, PEG requirements, public educational governmental channels. So we told cable system operators, look it, you have a, a choke point to information and ideas, we're going to regulate that to ensure access. But I think the theory there was that the spectrum was limited, that this was a, a limited good in the control of the government and so it had the right to, to regulate, to, to control access. It's a kind of antitrust idea, sure. Yes. Uh, it's a either in the case of the telephone company under AT&T, it was thought to be a natural monopoly if you wanted right. universal service. Cable is not a monopoly, but it's not it's a it's a local monopoly even right. if there's national competition. Right. Uh, but I would argue ISPs. It may not be a monopoly, but it's an oligopoly, and you could defend net neutrality regulations sure. uh, on a theory of, of antitrust and, and access because there's a strong incentive to self deal. If, if you own Netflix, then you stream Netflix faster. If you don't own Netflix, if you own say Time Warner, Comcast cable systems, you stream that right. content more quickly. Now we began this conversation talking about the sort of anything goes nature of free speech in, in America compared to other countries. Well, we might want to stop there for just a second. Go ahead. Okay, so Fred Schauer had a really great article in the Harvard Law Review about 14 years ago uh, on the salience of the First Amendment. Uh, when you buy an Rx, a prescription drug, you get the little box and there's this little fold out that ends up being yes. this big. Uh, Very small that's print. compelled speech. Right. The FDA requires the maker <coughs> of drugs to convey certain information about efficacy. In the interest effects. of safety and health and efficacy. Yes, but it's still compelled speech. Right. Uh, when you uh, consider buying stock uh, through an IPO, uh, the SEC has regulations out the yin yang regarding mandatory disclosures. That's compelled speech. Uh, rules involving uh, commercial fraud or copyright. All of those constrain speech fairly directly, and, and we don't generally frame those as implicating the First Amendment in a serious way. I think where there's a risk of government feather bedding, where there might be an incentive for the government to tilt or skew the marketplace of ideas, the First Amendment comes into play. But in areas where the possibility of government feather bedding is remote, like with RX disclosures, uh, federal courts and the American people don't even really see those as speech regulations. I mean, when you when you get that insert, do you think the government is uh, compelling this poor uh, uh, Lily company? To, I to actually make this don't speech? feel that way at all when I get the insert. I don't necessarily read it, but I think if I need information, it's there. And the pharmaceutical industry, we all think has tried to get away with things, so I, I think of that as a protection imposed a by consumer the protection, anti-fraud, right. uh, and, and I do too, and I don't see that as implicated. Probably neither one of us reads all that. Uh, uh, I, I, sometimes, I sometimes open them just to see how much small print they can fit yeah, on, uh, on the fold-out. But, right. uh, but, you know, it, 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 but it, if we it, needed it, it's there. Correct, but it is it is compelled speech. I understand that from the government, and if we if we if we thought all speech should be free, and, and, and we tell them you you can't say this grows hair. 
uh, if it doesn't. They have to do clinical trials and there has to be proven right. efficacy. Right. We even tell pharmaceutical manufacturers that they can't market, uh, except in the second circuit, uh, for uh, off-label <laughs> uses even if there's clinical evidence of efficacy. So we, we restrict speech pretty pretty broadly in this context. And uh, again, you can say there's a compelling government interest, but, but the courts don't do that. They just sort of hive it off from what we think of as the, the world of freedom of speech. So I, I do think that freedom of speech where the government might want to propagandize us or manipulate us or in, in some way trick us, uh, sneak something by us, courts have beady-eyed scrutiny uh, for that sort of stuff. But there is a world of regulations of speech in this country. Is this what you call free speech paternalism? Well, yes, we could call that free speech paternalism. Uh, efforts to, to ensure that information that's helpful or necessary to consumers is available to them. Uh, also where there's a, a problem with collective action, right? If you or I called Lily and said, tell us what the efficacy is, show us the studies, we wouldn't get very far. If the FDA says you can't legally sell this in the United States by prescription, unless you know you tell people this stuff, right. then Lily will do it. So uh, yes, the, the, though I don't go as far as, as, as some folks, uh, there's a, a professor uh, uh, at uh, Tulsa uh, who's written essentially that government ought to have a really free hand, uh, Tamara Piety, her name, a really free hand in regulating commercial advertising of all sorts. And I think her faith in government to, to behave reasonably is, is perhaps uh, overbroad. Well, it's not that long ago that doctors weren't permitted to advertise, lawyers weren't permitted to advertise, uh, though everybody else was. Was that an example of paternalism? I think so. It was an effort to maintain professional ethical standards right. and to protect the professions from themselves. And we actually see the court... Are you sorry that that changed? Uh, a little bit. Uh, it, it, again, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to sort of... Uh, it's hard to, to, on the one hand, I think providing services at a reasonable cost to consumers and providing truth. Think about funeral directors and the right. FTC's funeral director rule. They advertise too. Right, and they have to provide price information. They have right. compelled speech with respect to itemized services because people were being ripped off. Uh, they were in a, right. a moment of particular vulnerability and funeral directors were taking advantage of that. And so regulating what funeral directors can say or do and requiring them to, to provide truthful price information uh, strikes me as, as uh, a self-evidently justified government policy that, that doesn't raise the specter of skewing the marketplace of ideas. Um, lawyers and doctors could engage in, in speech that's highly problematic, uh, claiming efficacy or cures that don't work. Snake oil, right? That does uh, go on a fair amount, even despite some regulations now, don't you think? It, it, it does. Uh, on the other hand, actually, uh, commercial speech and professional speech is protected in Europe under the precedence of the European Court of Human Rights, so that uh, that's one area of First Amendment law where there is some congruence. Uh, the idea being that people have needs for accessing uh, the services of professionals, and if professionals don't have any speech rights, if government can regulate them at will, then... Sh should we be striving towards some kind of international standard of free speech, and what, what would... Well, uh, if we do that, we're going to look a lot more like Germany or Canada or South Africa than, than we presently do. We are such an outlier with respect to limitations on tort liability, mm -hmm. for invasion of privacy, for, for libel. Uh, if we had a global system of rules, we took a vote, even among Western-style democracies with uh, independent courts, rule of law values, democracy, entrenched rights our approach to free speech would, would not win that debate. So unless we want to make our law look more like German law. Well, we're, we're an outlier in many, I mean, climate change, we're certainly in, at the moment an outlier in the world. A takings clause too. Uh, Canada's equivalent of our due process clause, section seven of the charter, protects life, liberty, and wait for it, wait for it, security of the person. Poop. So in 1982, not the pursuit of happiness. Not the pursuit of happiness, and and not Canadians property. don't believe in being happy. <laughs> Security of the person. That's pretty good. Uh, 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 actually, their their sort of uh, 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 their motto is sort of uh, uh, order, uh, uh, good government, and order, uh, politeness. I'm trying to remember the exact phrase that's in the charter, and it's not coming to me. But uh, pursuit of happiness does not make it into the charter. Well, certainly politeness is not protected in this country. If it ever was, it isn't No, now. we don't have any mandatory civility rules. And that's also an example right. of a major global difference. So it's not just hate speech laws in places like Germany. Uh, there are laws involving mandatory forms of what we might call politesse. I can't give you der Vogel uh, or, or I can't do that. I can do it, but you could sue me civilly. Uh, and for I could win? 
You could. I could win nominal damages. If I sued you for giving me the finger. Yep. Uh, in in Germany, where else could I do that? Uh, France. Uh, most of Western Europe, uh, not in Canada, not in Japan. The country that comes closest to us is Japan. Uh, for a long time, Japan had no hate speech laws. They just, uh, the Diet just adopted some, but they're toothless and they're mainly precatory. I mm -hmm. think it's more of a public relations uh, gimmick uh, <laughs> than a meaningful commitment to limiting freedom of speech. Uh, in Japan, if you want to take a truck through Tokyo saying, you know, it's essential that we restore the power of the emperor. Or alternatively, we have to have a, a violent revolution and establish a mm -hmm. vanguard of the proletariat. That would Kumasa. be okay. Perfectly okay. In Perfectly Japan. protected. Uh, freedom of speech. The in latter Japan. would not necessarily be protected here. Uh, uh, only truck, if, only if my truck soundtrack through. was really persuasive. I mean, under if Brandenburg. If you took a truck through Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where I believe your law is your law school located right, in Tuscaloosa, Tuscaloosa um, that said it's time to establish the dictatorship of the proletariat. I have a feeling you'd run into trouble. The government would lose that case and it would have to pay me lawyer's fees under uh, the Civil Rights Attorneys Act of 76. But enough people don't think they could get away with that, that they don't seem to do it. Well, we did have an interesting case in Tuscaloosa involving a loud frat party and the police showed up uh, and the, the frat, the people of frat and the sorority uh, uh, sisters uh, started screaming at the police about where's your warrant, where's your warrant. Uh, and they were tased and the police, which was a, a gross abuse of police authority. But actually the rights consciousness of the Alabama uh, Greeks uh, sort of surprised and pleased <laughs> me because they were screaming about the Fourth Amendment and show me your warrant in right, my premises. Right. But, but <laughs> that's a fairly familiar thing that doesn't just happen in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. It happens in a lot of college and university communities around the United States, I mean, uh, treating loud parties and the like as, an, as a public nuisance. I don't know that much more is done. But, but I'm, I'm picking up on your example of running through town with a truck that has a big sign, it's time for revolution of the proletariat. Um, honestly, you know, I may be naive, but I honestly think the Tuscaloosa cops, uh, remember it is a university town, yes. would let that slide. Uh, in fact, there was a case recently in Texas where someone put a fuck Trump sticker on their truck. Oh, I know. Yes, yeah, a small uh, town. Right, small and town the police Texas. reacted to it, but the police stood down. There was no prosecution. Well, they arrested her. But there was a no pro. Uh, right. They should not have arrested her. Right. Well, uh, they said they arrested her on the basis of some outstanding warrant, but it, that... Pretextual, yeah, good luck with that, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, uh, the, some the, fraud warrant or something. That's actually a huge problem in our current free speech law. The Supreme Court might be doing something about it this term with the Florida case involving the pesky citizen who shows up at the uh, the uh, city council meetings in Riviera Beach. I'm forgetting the plaintiff's name, but uh, right. he argued that he had been pretextually arrested uh, in uh, retaliation for exercising his free speech rights, and uh, the district court rejected that. So arrested jury. lest he abuse his free speech rights, or in arrested. retaliation for having criticized oh, for having done so before, yes. so then arrested, uh, so he wouldn't do it again? In theory, I guess, theory. Uh, and to punish him for, for disrupting right. the meeting. Right, that's one of several uh, cases before the court in this period that are going to be very important for, for the First Amendment. I, I fear think. it's going to go the other way, though. Uh, about 10 years ago, the court held that uh, prosecutors essentially have absolute immunity so long as there's probable cause for prosecuting a case involving uh, an arrest associated so think, with free expression. So you think the court might stick with that kind of rule? I'm afraid so because yeah. the, there's a, a block on the current court that's very deferential to police, doesn't want police to have to second guess the exercise of their discretion. I think there are probably three or four votes because there were three or four votes in the earlier case to uh, require the police to establish good faith. Um, but we'll see. The, the, if probable cause uh, for any crime is enough to privilege an arrest, then Occupy Wall Street is in deep trouble. Right. Let's talk about libel laws. And the, the President of the United States says there should be tougher libel laws, um, uh, uh, in large part because, he, because he's aggrieved. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> Crooked Hillary. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> That's but, libelous. Uh, but that is libelous, you think? Well, I think so, Hillary? saying she's a crook. Uh, saying, saying she engages in fraud. Do you think fraud. she'd win if she if she? Oh, of course she would. Filed a suit? But I'm just saying, he, he, he doesn't want to live by the rules. He would have. Right. He, he, he wants what we might call uh, uh, les majesty laws. Right. Uh, if he's the president, uh, he wants John Adams' Sedition Act. Now, the, <laughs> the Sedition Act actually was a very that cleverly was, written law. Yeah. You, know who, you know who it protected, strictly speaking? No. It protected uh, false speech that brought the Congress or the president into disrepute. Do you see who's cut out of that? Big, big change now. Well, the vice president was cut out of the it. The vice president was cut out. You know who John Adams' vice yeah, president was? 
Uh, Thomas Jefferson. Correct. Yes. And he was not of the same party right. because the Constitution, as originally drafted, made the runner up in the Electoral College vice president. It was not right. a great idea, right. but Probably nonetheless. Not. Oh, you never, you know, when you think about it, it might have constrained presidential behavior somewhat. If, yes, if, that, if, that's true. I would not if mind. If bad behavior having, got uh, the, your, uh, your Kane, opponent. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, or Hillary, or, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Hillary yeah. is vice president. That would be an interesting dynamic. That would be a very interesting dynamic. I wonder if they'd even speak to each well, other. But, okay. but let, let's get to this libel thing for a moment. Um, you know, a lot of people, and I dare say including me, uh, complain sometimes. You can say anything about anyone online these days, and no one's going to go after you. No one's going to, and, and it depends whether you're on the uh, saying end or the receiving end, I think, of any particular instance, what you think about that. Wouldn't, wouldn't there be some legitimate intellectual argument for tougher libel protection in this country? Oh, of course. And, and the situation that exists is not a function of the First Amendment. It's a function in large part of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which immunizes the platforms from any obligation mm -hmm. to, to, to moderate uh, the content. Uh, in fact, moderation opens them the up to The media liability. platforms. Right. right. Uh, right. The ISPs, Google, right. uh, Washington Post, New York Times. I mean, right. many of them do moderate. But uh, under the CDA Section 230, uh, if you provide an opportunity for third-party speakers, so long as you don't actively edit, uh, you can't be held liable for defamation uh, for content. But you know, if speech is knowingly false, First Amendment, even New York Times v. Uh, Sullivan doesn't right. protect intentionally false speech. New York Times v. Speech. Sullivan, 1965, Four. 64, uh, said that if you're a public figure, Forget it. You can't sue, right? I mean, Not exactly. Basic message. Uh, uh, it's, okay, so make my interpretation more subtle. So if, if you're a public official or a public figure, you can't recover against a media defendant unless you show falsity uh, of and, and concerning you and, 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 with and, clear and convincing intent, evidence. Intent to... And either knowledge of falsehood right. or reckless indifference to truth right. or falsehood. Right. So if, if the New York Times... It must be very hard to prove reckless indifference, I would think. It would be very hard. You'd have to show an utter absence of, of compliance with journalistic standards. Uh, in fact, New York Times v. Sullivan has been rejected uh, in every jurisdiction to consider it. Canada, the UK, European Court of Human Rights, South Africa, they consider it because they have to. They, they, they reject it. Uh, in those jurisdictions, the standard for liability generally requires the media defendant to show reportage on a matter of public concern that was reasonable. So it can be false. They can either prove truth, which gets them off the hook. That's the common law obligation. Prove truth, which you can't do a lot of times. Very prove, hard to prove truth. Uh, but if you can't prove truth, if you show publication in the public interest mm -hmm. uh, and reasonable even if it's false, even if it's false. But you know, uh, to American eyes, you know, publication in the public interest. What is that? Uh, would, would Bill and Monica be a matter of public interest? Well, I'm, I'm not sure it would be in Germany or France. Uh, so that courts essentially decide the meets and bounds right. of matter of public right. interest, so, whereas in the United States, uh, journalists do. This status in the United States of libel being an outlier, essentially, in the Western world, is what you're saying, is that good? Is that, is that sort of a sign of the, the frontier spirit and the independence of Americans, or, or is that uh, a kind of abuse of the system? I don't know. I'm a little conflicted. I, I wrote a book on comparative privacy law that engages in a fairly serious way the conflict between privacy and dignity in speech and press rights. And uh, I think, you know, it's sort of like Goldilocks and the porridge, too hot, too cold, <laughs> just right. Uh, the, uh, the porridge in the U.S. may be too cold. I'm not sure that the cost of being a politician is having no ability to get a forced admission of error on a standard less than malice aforethought with clear and convincing evidence. Oh, and another bell or whistle, on appeal, if you lose as a media defendant, you get de novo review of constitutional fact by the appellate court. It is a very rough slog very for hard. a plaintiff, sure. uh, a public figure, public official plaintiff. You know, and very expensive, I'm sure. Extremely expensive. Uh, so you know, would the, would the sky fall, would there be a chilling effect if we allowed a public figure, public official, person involved in matter of public concern to obtain a declaration of falsity and a forced retraction, uh, would that chill journalism unduly? I, I don't think so. So maybe New York Times v. Sullivan is needed for damages awards. I mean, in Alabama, mm -hmm. there were like 40 copies of the New York Times edition that mentioned Sullivan in the whole state. And he had been awarded a half million dollars in damages. And there were three or four other suits. it was an Alabama case. Oh, yes, yes. New York, New York Times, Times v. Sullivan. Sullivan. So you're, very, an Alabama, you're a very uh, relevant witness. Well, Alabama's case. made a lot of con law, uh, right. particularly in the 1960s, unfortunately. Right. Uh, right. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, 
the standard may go too far in forcing public officials, public figures, and people involved but, but in public concerns. But how about private figures? How about, I mean, a public official has a platform to say you're a liar, it's fake news, whatever. Uh, how about private persons who get libeled? Well, uh, under Gertz v. Welch, they can recover on a showing of negligence or more for compensatory damages, but punitive damages are subject to the New York Times Sullivan right. rule of actual malice. And it doesn't happen very often, does it? No, it's very hard. If you're a, a private person who gets sucked into the, if you're Monica Lewinsky, for example, right. uh, good luck suing for libel. Sure. It's just not going to work, even right. if technically the standard of liability is a little more forgiving. For so one last point I'd like to ask you about, especially given your cross-cultural perspective here. What about the right to be forgotten? What about the, 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 the rule now increasingly popular in Europe that you can find something that about yourself on Google that was wrong, that was inappropriate, and you can ask that it be expunged, that it, that it be taken off. And well, de-indexed, technically. So de the New York indexed. Times story, of the de-indexed is the term right. of art. So the internet search provider has to pull the result right. from the results that are provided. Right. But the if you know where to look, so if we're talking about anyway. Mario Castejo Gonzalez, uh, the, the newspaper in his town that reported on the forced sale of its property, uh, that story is still available on that website. You just have to go look for it on that website. You can't use Google or Bing to search Mario right. Castejo Gonzalez. Uh, so, but, so it has the effect of making the information harder invis to retrieve. less visible, maybe invisible, needle and haystack, harder to retrieve. Uh, I don't like it because it applies, the difference between the U.S. and Europe, there, there's a lesser protection for public officials and public figures, but Princess Caroline of Monaco has a, a right to her privacy and dignity. Angela Merkel does it. There's a case in Germany where the governor, the prime minister of Bavaria, is presented as a rutting pig with the local judges of the Bavarian Supreme Court. And uh, an entire issue of- Not an attractive image. Not an attractive image. Uh, Strauss caricature is the name of the case. And uh, a humor magazine like The Onion or MAD publishes this, uh, this cartoon or wants to. The courts issue an injunction against distribution of the entire run of the magazine. Uh, because they say to present Prime Minister Strauss as a rutting pig is to deny his dignity. Uh, that, that, that presenting him in this way is not necessary. This to must have been policies. quite a while ago. Was it was in the 70s, but right. uh, there was a more recent case in which uh, Prime Minister Erdogan was mocked on a Saturday Night Live oh, step right. Bowman, yes. and Bowman uh, was uh, criminally indicted uh, for mocking the size and character of Erdogan's uh, private parts. Uh, and it was funny, too, uh, Bowman uh, actually said, I couldn't say this. It was sort of the Trumpian, well, there are people who say. He backed into it and talked about his lawyer's advice about what he could or couldn't say on German television. And actually, this uh, is the president, now president of Turkey. Yes, and uh, of course, uh, Angela Merkel's government is working uh, with Erdogan on refugee right. uh, migrant issues. So they didn't issues. want him insulted or maligned in Germany because it would make things harder. Correct. So there was a political and a foreign a pol policy reason right. for it. But the Germans were generally outraged uh, that criticism of Erdogan as a tyrant by, by mocking his, his physical, and, and no one took it seriously. That's the other thing, right? No one, no one took it. He compared uh, his member to a donor, a smelly donor, uh, a sausage. Uh, and uh, the, uh, it, it, was, it was hyperbolic. It was outrageous. It was like the Hustler v. Falwell parody right, the, of Jerry uh, Falwell. Jerry Falwell, the, uh, the famous the first case, time. which the Supreme Court said was just fine. Yes, uh, that, that uh, criticism of public figures and officials can be caustic and unpleasant, and that's just the price of democracy. The European Court of Human Rights, the European Court of Justice, the Federal Constitutional Court of Germany, just don't view the matter that way. Uh, even the Prime Minister of Germany, the Chancellor of Germany, uh, has a right to protection, legal protection, of her dignity uh, and her honor. So is that better? No, I, I don't think it is. Uh, it, it, it seems to me that, uh, when you start getting involved in matters of kind or degree uh, and, and engaging in proportionality analysis about how far is too far, you really open the door to comprehensive forms of government censorship. I mean, I grew up in Mississippi, and my public schools were integrated with the help of the National Guard in the 70s. Right. And so if you think about the NAACP or SNCC or CORE trying to uh, amass public support in downtown Jackson or Biloxi in the 50s or 60s, a government that had the power to declare that a terroristic threat uh, or to say that comments about Ross Barnett could, or Jim Eastland were defamatory, could have silenced them. Sure, yeah. so Bankrupted a government that could do that them. could prevent progress, could prevent reform. Yes, it's a two-edged sword. So whatever rules create liability to protect Hillary Clinton from false maligning speech 
are going to protect people who attack uh, Richard, are going to open up people who attack Richard Spencer to liability and silencing. Well, Richard Spencer, much of what's said about him, he would agree with. That's probably true. Thank you very much, Professor Kodosinski. Thank you. Thank Good you. Good to see you. Yep. We've been discussing free speech from a cross-cultural perspective with Ronald Kodosinski, professor of law at the University of Alabama. To learn more about Georgetown University's Free Speech Project, please visit our website. Thanks for watching. I'm Sanford Unger.